we're going to start talking about block coding here. The first few videos in this playlist talked about channel capacity, and that channel capacity was the upper limit at which we could reliably communicate over a channel. And by reliably communicate, that means you know have arbitrarily low probability of bit error rate. The big result there was that you know Shannon proved that there exist error control codes that let you achieve that arbitrarily low data rate. So what are these you know, error control codes that exist? This right here is not particularly the one he derived in his paper, but we do wanna just talk about a specific type of error control codes called block coding. The type of codes that we could talk about, we could talk about block codes, we could talk about convolutional codes. There are a ton of topics that we could dive into. I personally think block codes are the simplest to understand initially. So we're gonna talk about block codes in general and then talk about a specific subclass of codes called linear codes. Linear codes are also block codes, so we'll get to um, talking about linear block codes in some subsequent videos as well. But for the most part, we're gonna to try to keep kind of the world of material that we're gonna dive into really focused on block coding. So before we get into the details and definition of block coding, just remember one of our assumptions, we're gonna go ahead and assume that the data that we're going to encode for an, from an error control coding perspective has already been perfectly source encoded. So my bit stream is independent and equally likely zeros and ones. So I have this you know, flip of a coin, zero and one data stream coming at me. And then I'm gonna be taking this data, I'm gonna go ahead and add some redundant information to it. That's the error control pro coding process. And then I'm gonna transmit that over my communication channel and that data is then received at the receiver. For the sake of our discussion, we're gonna assume that my channel that I'm transmitting over is what we call a binary symmetric channel, a BSC. And this channel is parameterized by the transition probability, P. So P is a probability, and it tells me the probability of given that I transmitted a one, what's the probability that I receive a zero? So really P, little p, is a probability of error. And the probability of transmitting a one and receiving a zero, what I have circled right here, that's what that means, given one that I got zero, it's also equal to the probability that I sent a zero, but I received a one. So little p talks about these transition probabilities. We don't want transitions to occur. What I want is given that I sent a zero, I want a zero to be received. Or given that I sent a one, I want a one to be received. Obviously, those are very related to little p, they're just one minus p, but p is the error probability of this binary symmetric channel. And that's how we're gonna think about errors occurring. Errors occur on a bit level with probability p. All right, so that is an assumption and how our channel works. What is a block coder? A block coder operates on blocks of data, not too surprisingly. It is gonna wait until it has k bits of data and then it is gonna take that K chunk of data and it's going to map it to what we call a message word. So when you see W, think of message word, and the subscript there is really you know, the nth message word. This is just a string of bits that are K long. So if we wanna write out all the bits, we write it like this. In the nth message, there is the zeroth bit and the first bit all the way out to the K minus oneth bit. So when we talk about bit locations, we do kind of zero-based indexing. We're gonna take these K bits, and maybe just for the sake of you know, having things concrete in your head, maybe think of you know, K being four. So I'm gonna take four bits, and I'm gonna map that to some output code word. So the code words always have X. So if you see X, think code word. And these are of length N. N is always bigger than K. So again, for the sake of just kind of picturing something concrete, if k is 4, maybe n is 7. So I'm going to take an input of 4 bits and map it to something that has 7 bits. When I do this mapping, I'm going to do it carefully so that my mapping is 1 to 1. All the code words need to be the same. That kind of makes sense. We kind of talked about that even in digital comms. If I'm going to construct a big list of signals and I'm going to transmit those signals to represent information, I really want all those signals to be as different as possible. Very same thing here. All my code words that I'm gonna transmit, I would like them all to be different and you know, as different as possible. So at the receiver, I can distinguish code words from each other as easy as possible. 
So if I'm going to transmit some code word vector, I'm going to receive the vector y, and that received vector could be exactly what I transmitted if the error vector e is zero. However, we know when I transmit over my channel, that channel could flip some bits. So this error vector could have some entries that are non-zero. There could be a, a one in one of the entries that flips one of the bits. And then what I receive isn't exactly a code word, but a code word who's had a few bits flipped. So really all a block code is, is just a mapping. It's a mapping between the two to the K message words. So there's two to the K of them. If K is three, um, four, like we've been discussing, two to the four is 16. So it's a mapping between 16 message words to all the code words. So here right here is an example of what we mean by a block code. It's just a big list of all possible message words. In this case, there's 16 of them. And then how they map to the corresponding code words. So it's just a big lookup table. That's all it is. Another important term here related to block codes is what we call the code rate. The code rate is a ratio of the number of original message bits to the total number of bits that I transmit. So typically, I personally want code rates really high. When I replace three, four bits with seven bits, that's really kind of a waste, right? I now have to transmit seven things to really only convey four bits of information. So from the efficiency standpoint, I don't like having to have a code rate less than one at all because it's adding this redundant information that lowers my effective data rate. However, from an encoding perspective, the lower the code rate, the better in terms of providing robustness to errors. One thing we'll see is that as code rate gets lower and lower and lower, my ability to correct errors gets better and better and better. So there's this fundamental trade-off with code rate. Um, code rates being high is good from an efficiency perspective, but bad from error control coding. Code rates low are bad from an efficiency perspective, but great from an ability to correct errors. This table right here, we're going to use that really throughout the rest of the videos. This is a specific instance of what's called a Hamming code, and we'll define what a Hamming code is, obviously. But this table here and kind of the list of the 16 messages, those original message words, the W, and the code words that they map to, we'll be re revisiting this table quite a few times in the subsequent examples. So this is just one particular instance of a block code. Let's think about you know, how we might want to go about constructing this mapping. I've just provided you a mapping here and just said, here's what it is. If you ever have a message word of 0000, zero, zero, zero map that to this code word. And if you ever have an input bitstream of 0100, zero, 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 then map it to this code word. So one question you might ask is, how do you come up with that mapping? And that's a very good question. Hopefully, um, based on the previous discussion just a minute or two ago, having the code words different from each other seems like it should make sense. If they're all very different from each other, then if I make a bit error, I still may be able to figure out what my received vector is closest to. If you look at the table on the previous chart and you do kind of a, a close look, what you'll notice is all the code words are different from each other in at least three bit positions. The easiest way to see that, let's just look, compare this to this. The all zero vector is different from that because that one has three ones, so it's different by at least three bit positions. And any other pair that I pick has the same thing. Compare those two. Those are different in at least three bit positions. Any pair that you pick is different by at least three bit positions. So think about that. I have all these unique code words. If no errors occur when I receive Y, I can perfectly find that received vector in my list of code words and decoding back to the original message bits is trivial. If only one bit error is present, I can still kind of find out who the closest one is you know, I kind of look through my table, I compare Y to my code words, and I go find out who matches the best. There's probably one that still matches well, what we consider closest. And I could still map it back to my original message bits. And even though there was a bit error in the code word, my original message bits are still preferred, are still preserved. So some of the same things that we talked about in digital comms, having things that are different from each other, you know, uncorrelated is kind of a good thing. And this definition of closest is, seems to be coming up. 
So to me, this coding strategy, as I've described here, is kind of an intuitive way to think about how we would go about constructing the mapping from bits to code words. What we really need to do is formally derive what the right, you know, mathematically rigorous coding strategy is. And we're going to do that in the next video. We're actually going to come up with kind of the optimal decoding strategy. And that tells us that the distance between code words is a very important criteria.